Patrick McArdle. I am a moral theologian and I work for Australian Catholic University, though in the past I have worked for Catholic Health Australia. It was in that capacity I became quite familiar with the Code of Ethical Standards and I'm presenting the module in the uh, Decoding the Code course on the dignity of the human person. That's a central concept in Catholic social teaching and in many ways it's the concept that holds the whole of Catholic social teaching together. And I guess most people are familiar with that, but it's also one of the areas in which a, a level of cogency and coherence comes to the way we understand Catholic social teaching. It's also integral to how we understand ethics in the Catholic tradition. So today's presentation has four parts to it. Firstly, I want to describe how we understand the concept of the dignity of the human person and what we mean by a human person. Secondly, that the concept of vulnerability is key to how we understand the dignity of persons and why human personality is so crucial to our, the way we understand ethics. Thirdly, that the human person is the central subject of healthcare ministry and of ethics in the Catholic tradition. Finally, I want to give four practical examples of how the dignity of the human person has a profound impact in the way we do ethics in healthcare. The dignity of the human person is a coordinating principle in Catholic social teaching. It's at the heart of what we understand a person to be and the heart of what we understand ethics to be. Most of us, I think, will get that this is built on our relationship with the divine. And I'll explore a little bit about that into the future. But perhaps the most salient and, and uh, good summary of that was a small part from, a small quotation from Benedict XVI's encyclical, God is Love where he indicated that Christianity was not an ethical choice. It was not a lofty idea. It was an encounter with an event, a specific person, the person of Jesus Christ. And that through that encounter, our horizon of meaning and our horizon for action was changed and became a paradigm for direct action in the world. In terms of looking at the dignity of the human person as an inherent dignity, I think there are three elements that we have to consider in this. The first is the one I'm sure we're all familiar with, the creation stories, in which God creates the world and humanity, and we're told almost ad nauseum in the first chapter of Genesis that each and every part of the creation is good, including humanity. and that humanity itself is created in the image and likeness of God. And this is often used as shorthand for the dignity of the human person, that we have dignity and inalienable dignity because we're in the image and likeness of God. However, exploring that doesn't always get us very far. What it's linked to, though, is the concept of relationality that when God forms the creation as a gracious act of God himself, he also establishes a set of relationships, relationships between the various elements of the creation, but then a particular relationship between humanity, the human persons, and God's self, the divine being, and that that is linked to a specific task that God has for the humans. And that task is about care, nurture and support of the creation. So in a way, the dignity of the human person comes not just because we're the image and likeness of God, but because this part of creation, who we are, is fundamental to achieving God's purpose in creation. We, if you like, become co-creators with God of the world around us. The final element of that, and I guess what demonstrates to us about what the dignity of the human person really is, is that in a particular way we encounter human dignity in the person of Jesus. So in this one person, the divine and the human are absolutely united. But what it tells us is that humanity has to be capable of God, that is capax dei in the Latin, that in humanity alone is the creation able to be united with the divine. 
in the case of Jesus, perfectly, in the case of the rest of us, moving towards greater unity and greater unification with God and the divine being and the divine plan for creation. The dignity of the human person is founded on vulnerability, the inherent vulnerability within each person. And there are two elements of this. One is that I have no control over my own existence or my own coming into being. I am the result of the DNA of two other persons that comes together to create a unique human being. But also to get from the point of conception to the adult I now am, has required the interaction and relationships with countless other people. Some of those are really obvious to us and we pay attention to them, our siblings, our parents, our extended family, those we choose to love, those we choose to be in relationships with. However, it's no less complex when we consider all of the relationships that are hidden from us. So whatever you sat down for for breakfast today or for dinner tonight was formed through uh, a countless a range of relationships, whether it be from a farmer to a processor to salesman to delivery men, all of which are hidden from you, but which have formed an important part of who you are, whether we kind of acknowledge that or not. When you think about it, in healthcare this becomes even more obvious. If you've got a patient, uh, a resident, a client, somebody we're caring for, they may see the healthcare professional, the pastoral care worker, the person who brings their meals, and they may attend to them as a caregiver, as somebody who's assisting with their healing. What they probably won't see is the person who made the prosthetics, the person who's responsible for the linen being clean, the person who's responsible even for um, arranging the cleaning of the building. And yet those people also have an integral relationship to their health status. And so um, that's a good illustration, I think, of, of why relationality is key to how we understand the dignity of the human person. So not only has that relationality formed us and given us um, through relationship with the divine and inherent dignity, it also lays upon us obligations. And this is at the key of our ethical understanding. So the obligations that arise to us are because we're in relationships that God has called us, God has chosen us to participate in the divine work. And uh, as a result of that, we have a particular relationship which forms us as human beings and gives us a particular dignity. But there are also obligations that flow from it. That because I'm in relationship with other people, those close to me and those more in a more extended or hidden relationship, I have both a universal and a particular set of obligations which flow from that. And when I don't meet those, I'm not calling into question the dignity of those who I'm not serving or those who I may be wronging in some fashion. I'm actually calling into question my own dignity. This is quite clearly shown in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, the parable of the Last Judgment, and I would assume most people are familiar with that. So this is where Jesus says that on the last day, people will be called to give account for themselves and they'll be divided, the sheep from the goats. And the criteria for which their judgment will be is very practical and very grassroots. There are people who are hungry, who are thirsty, who are sick, who are imprisoned, who are homeless, who are naked. And the criteria for judgment is, did I respond to their need? Did I do seek to meet their need? And so when we try to examine what the Code of Ethical Standards is about, in a very practical way, that's what it is. It's responding to the need. The human person is always and everywhere individual and communal. So as I said earlier, we're created and we're formed through a multiplicity of relationships. Two people's DNA, these days at least two people's DNA, were influential in forming me into who I well, am. The relationships I've had throughout my life have formed me into who I am today. However, when you attend to me, when you render care to me, it's almost always on a one-to-one -one basis. That when we look into each other's eyes, there really is, as the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas said, only two options. Ultimately, you can reject me or you can embrace me. And if it is about my vulnerability, my need, 
in a sense revolts you, then chances are you're going to reject me. And if the lesson of my life has been that every time somebody looks at me, my experience is one of rejection, then it's really hard for that person's innate dignity to shine through. It's hard for that person perhaps to believe in the dignity of themselves. Um, similarly, if the messages I've been given through those relational, relational encounters are that I am a positive, worthwhile human being, that my vulnerability is acknowledged, respected and loved, then chances are that will actually contribute to who I am as a person. But the encounter is always one-to-one. -one. It's only when we recognise that we are part of a group when I have to acknowledge that I am not just me, somehow I am me and you. So even when we use the word I, that word only has meaning, only has referential um, or linguistic sense when it's being used with another person. So it doesn't make any sense to, res to say I if I'm the only person in the room. Yeah. So even in the way we understand language, we're automatically recognising that our individuality is predicated, if you like, on our communality, on our shared existence. So that whenever we are talking about an individual, and a lot of the things in the Code of Ethical Standards do refer to individuals because they're often the subject of our care, whether in aged care or acute care. The, the individual is receiving the care. However, the very fact these entities and institutions exist demonstrate to us that we are existing in a community and that it's as a member of a community that I have the need for health or aged care or community care. It's as a member of a community that you are responding to my need. And so when we talk about the human person, we need to keep those two aspects in tension. And in Catholic social teaching, these are often referred to as the principles of subsidiarity, that I get to make decisions about myself and my life, or that decisions are made at the lowest possible level. But there, that principle is linked intrinsically to the concept of solidarity or the concept of the common good. That is that it's only together that we're able to respond genuinely in terms of ethics. It's only as a community that we're able to respond with health care beyond um, the needs of an individual or the capacity of an individual. And as I demonstrated earlier, that's you know, most health care um, whether it's simply the provision of meals or something complex, takes a group of people. It's not something one person can do. I want to give four examples of how this is relevant in health and aged care or, or even community care. The first of those is something about our understanding of life. The second is a quite practical one in how we approach the issue of consent. The third is specifically about aged care and end of life. And I know those two aren't in exactly always related, but I think the, the point I want to make is pertinent to that. And the final one is about the Catholic nature or the Catholic identity of our healthcare institutions. And each of these four things I think are good ways of demonstrating or illustrating what the dignity of the human person means and why it's crucial to what we do. In the Catholic tradition, we take the view that life is a gift and it is a gift from God. It's because of a relationship we have. Now this can be challenging in our health and aged care institutions. Not all of our staff are Catholic. Not all of those we render care and service to are Catholic. However, the institution does shape that and it does so from within this particular tradition. You don't necessarily have to accept that, uh, but you do have to understand where that comes from. So the understanding of life as a gift from God, or if you want to put it in more secular terms, a gift from, uh, from one's parents to oneself. And sometimes that gift is not always as well received as one might like, but it is nonetheless a gift. And therefore, we understand that life deserves particular protection. And I guess that's because we do recognise its precariousness that we could in fact be walking down the street this afternoon and someone just pushes us in front of a car. We could slip and fall downstairs. Life is very precarious. And in a sense, for that reason, we should understand it as a gift. And it's one where we understand 
what people are going through at those times in their lives where they are forced to face the precariousness of life. So part of what the code tries to do by its strident protection of life is to recognise that that dignity isn't taken away just because we don't respond to it, just because the society is continually giving messages that older people or poor people or people with um, complex health needs are not somehow as valuable, usually economically, as those who are contributing large amounts in taxes or something. So it's really important that we understand that the dignity of the human person is innate and that when we act to protect life, we do so not because the particular individual is somebody that we are saying has a special place for us, except that every individual has that special place. And every individual has that because we take the view that life is sacred, that life is precious, and that because we know it is precious because it's precarious. You know, it's like looking at a really incredibly fragile vase. You know, if we can see that it's a nice Ming Dynasty vase and it's worth a countless amount, and that if somebody just pushed it slightly over, it would be destroyed. And it's not the money that we note, it's the fact that a thing of beauty has been lost. And it's exactly the same with each human person. And that's why we take the view that life is such a crucial dimension in the code of ethical standards and why the protection of life in all of its forms, but especially in its most vulnerable forms, is something that we have an obligation to uh, not only act to protect, but to stridently tell people that we act to protect it. One of the issues that I find comes up increasingly in healthcare it probably isn't as obvious in aged care or community care, but it's implicit in those two, is the whole issue of consent. And the reason it's in our face in, in acute care is that you have to sign a consent form. There's a legal obligation to do so. And almost no one has read the fine print to indicate that the healthcare professional has explained all of the procedures to you and what the likely risks and benefits of those procedures are. That's why it's in our face. We have a consent form because we believe that individuals have the right to determine what happens to them. That just because I'm sick and I go to the doctor, obviously implicit in that is that I want to get well. It's not automatically implicit in that that I want them to chop off my, um, my leg. It's not immediately obvious in that that I need blood samples taken. It might be, but it's not necessarily that way. In Health, in aged care and uh, community care, consent is also vital. People have consented to live with us. People have consented to the kinds of regimes that we have to have within institutions to make it manageable for a community of people. And depending on the nature of the institution, that, that can be quite um, severe limitations on their freedom. In most cases it's not, but it's still implicit there. So we want individuals to be able to make those choices and routinely make those choices. But there's also a community dimension. And this is probably where uh, aged care and community care can see this much more clearly perhaps than in acute care. So if a doctor comes in and says, we have to amputate your leg, the focus is on the person having their leg amputated. But if there's a change to the treatment regime or the care protocols for somebody in aged care, I think there's a recognition within most aged care institutions, it's not just this person, but it's their extended family, it's their caregivers, it's a range of other people. So in terms of consent, we both focus on the needs of the individual and the inherent dignity of the individual. They have the right to say what will happen to them, when it will happen. But we also recognise that we're part of a wider community. The fact that my father wanted only two options from surgery. He either wanted to die during it or he wanted they to cure him. Neither of those were acceptable options. You know, so you have to work with a community and you have to have them explain that these are the sorts of things that there are limitations on what we do. And most people in a community or a communal function, structure recognise that. Both things are held in tension and they're both part of the inherent dignity of the human person. The third example is about aged care and end of life care. And I'm conscious of the fact that these things don't necessarily go together, uh, or at least intrinsically together. You know, people die at any age. People are aware of their dying at any age, and hence we would talk about end-of-life care. 
But there is a particular thing about aged care that does link it, and that is the sense that we are moving into a period of transition, a period in which perhaps our bodily existence is giving way to a greater awareness of our transcendent existence, that we will leave a legacy. Now, in the Christian tradition, we hope that that is about union with God in the with the divine forever after. But even for those people who may not share that faith belief, there is always a willingness or an openness towards the end of life to say, what have I lived for? What have I existed for? What contribution have I made? How will I live, leave behind? And the part of the way we approach good end of life care or good aged care in our tradition is to recognise that people's lives have value and that we move to celebrate that value in a, in a whole lot of ways that have to be meaningful to the person. You know, that when you look at what we may have done, you know, nobody says, I paid a fortune in taxes. Nobody says, I, you know, earned an awful lot of money. What we say is that we made a difference to people's lives. They're the things that are really important and are valuable. And so one of the things that is really incredibly valuable about Catholic health and aged care, and I guess particularly in some ways our aged care um, institutions, is that they give people a sense of their value. They give people the opportunities to celebrate, both individually and with a community, what has been happening for them and how their lives have meaning. And it's when we do things like that that we are in fact celebrating the inherent dignity of the human person. One of the burning questions of the early part of the 21st century for Catholic institutions, whether they're health, aged care, community care, Catholic education, uh, Catholic schools, whatever, has been this question of Catholic identity. How do we define what it is for an institution to be Catholic in a time where there is declining church attendance, where there's declining religious adherence? How do we make that difference? How do we claim that this is a mission and an activity of the church? And how do we demonstrate that? Well, in most of our institutions, we do it by having a Catholic name. It's Saint something, or it's named after a well-known Catholic entity or person, or it's a link with a religious order. Catholic health and aged care institutions, Catholic community care institutions, have a lot of iconography that demonstrate they're Catholic. Well, both of those are good. We should call things after saints as role models. We should have iconography. But neither of those are sufficient because it's the work that goes on in those institutions. It's when we notice that in a religious or a Christian-based school or a Christian-based health care or a Christian-based aged care or community care institution that the person matters. And this is frequently what you get told by people when they say that our institutions are different or the people who work in our institutions are different from those they encounter in similar institutions elsewhere. That there's an awareness that the person matters. Because quite honestly, without that, it really doesn't matter if we have nice iconography. It really doesn't matter if we're named after Jesus himself. Unless that is manifested in the way we approach people, that's the key of our Catholic identity. The dignity of the human person, as Pope Benedict pointed out, is focused on an encounter, an encounter with a specific person. And it's interesting, while in the reference I made to it, I used the term that it was an encounter with the person of Jesus Christ, the actual sentence in Deus Caritas Est, God is love, doesn't say that. It says that it's not an ethical choice, it's not a lofty idea, it is an encounter with a specific event, a specific person and then the sentence ends. What that encounter does is change our horizon. And I think this is true about church ministry. When we encounter someone, the chaplain, the surgeon, the nurse, the carer, the social worker, the occupational therapist, who's operating out of that, even if the religious significance of it is of secondary or no importance to them, as long as the dignity of the human person is what they're operating out of and what they're seeking to serve because of their obligation to recognise it, then we're meeting that encounter. We give the person the sense that in encountering them, they are encountering the healing ministry of Jesus, is the way we would express it religiously. We might come up with some other ways of putting that, but regardless, it's a person-to-person -person encounter that changes our horizons. And in those rare instances when we've saved someone's life or we've given them hope or we give them the capacity to face death with courage and fortitude, 
we have altered their horizon. No longer are they looking at the world as though it's a place of doom and gloom. They're operating out of a paradigm of hope. That's the real key to what it is we do in our institutions. It's what makes them Catholic. But if I take us back to the beginning point, we need to recognise that this is founded, this very concept emerges from our understanding of the relationships that we have, the relationships which have created us and which have formed us. As a person of faith, I might want to take the next step and say that this is because of the relationship with God, that the gift God has given us in life and in the creation is fundamental to that. There could be others who don't share that faith commitment but who can still see that their life is a gift from someone else, that the way they live their life has in, with, linked within it an obligation to respond in a way of a gift given and received. And that's when we see what the dignity of the human person is all about.